Lamentations. They are the same writer, Jeremiah and Lamentations. 52 chapters in Jeremiah, 5 in Lamentations. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, spelled Jeremias or Jeremy. No, I like Jeremiah. He's, I like his uh, personality. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand your words. I do pray that you'd help us to give a, a, a good uh, and honest uh, preview of this uh, very large book. And I pray that you'd help us to... Uh, see that uh, Jeremiah also uh, is prophesying about uh, many future events. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Jeremiah, uh, right after Isaiah, Jeremiah is the last major prophet in Judah. And just one feller, he had a very, very small ministry in numbers, per se. Uh, but he had an international ministry as far as an individual, where he would uh, prophesy, write things out, and uh, influenced or at least was directed at many, many nations. Uh, just one fella. Okay, uh, its title of the book is the book of Jeremiah, and uh, if you would, look in chapter 22. Uh, the last major king of Judah is found in chapter 22, and this is the official, official last king. Now, there are other kings, but uh, they were not really... Ex- uh, Allowed by God, or I guess you could say, or they were allowed, but uh, not officially recognized. Okay, in chapter 22, verse 24, it says, As I live, saith the Lord, though Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the signet upon my right hand, yet would I pluck thee hence, or thence. Okay, the Coniah, you, you see he spells it with a C, Coniah. Uh, his full name is Jeconiah, the J-E in the front of it. And God was so upset with this guy, he said, I'm taking your name off, my name off yours. So, and he's the last major king. Uh, verse 29, he wants everybody to know that. Oh, earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. And then the last verse, it says, Thus saith the Lord, write this man childless. A man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon a throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Okay, so he had uh, no sons that were uh, allowed by God to prosper as a king of Judah. And that's the lineage that Jesus Christ comes through. But of course, Jesus is not his direct son, per se. He's the son of God. So that's the official last king. Jeremiah was a friend with Josiah. You'll find him in 2 Kings. Josiah had the last great revival that Judah experienced. He and Jeremiah grew up together. Jeremiah, you'll see in chapter 1, was a priest. He was the son of a priest. His dad was a high priest or a priest of Judah. And Josiah's dad was a king, so those were uh, worked very closely in hand in that day. So they were two boys that grew up together, and Jeremiah had a very long, sustained ministry. But his ministry was pretty well negative. Okay, so if you would look in chapter 1, verse 4, and you'll see uh, the ministry God gave him. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee prophet unto the nations. Not just one nation, Judah, a bunch of them. Okay, there's a good verse showing that the uh, baby in the womb is a living soul. Uh, And women a lot of times say, let me do with my body what I want. Go ahead, do with your body what you want, but that other body inside there is not yours. Okay, but, and they're very fortunate their mama didn't do what they want to do. And maybe we'd be more fortunate if their mama did it, but I don't know. (laughs) Okay, but even at that. And then he said, then said I, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I'm a child. So he resisted the calling that God had for him. He didn't, he wasn't forced to take it. 
He didn't think he was qualified. And then the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. And the reason why he says that is he's going to be saying uh, what the media calls mean-spirited, politically incorrect. He's going to be speaking against people. And so people are going to be going ballistic. Okay, and you can see the generation that's coming up are absolutely out of their gourd. Okay, these left-wing liberal lunatics. Uh, Verse 10, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have set thee, uh, this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out. Now here's this ministry, to root out, one, negative, To pull down, negative. To destroy, negative. And to throw down, negative. And to build and to plant, positive. So two-thirds negative, one-third positive. Okay, so that was his calling. That was his ministry. And because of that, not too many people liked him. Verse 18 For behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city and an iron pillar pillar and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. Boy, wouldn't you like to have a ministry like that? You are well known, but yet unknown, as Paul said. And they shall fight against thee. And they shall not prevail against thee, for I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. Now, I'm sure many times Jeremiah doubted that, especially when he was in the pokey. Several times in jail, uh, a couple times in a dungeon. And when you read through the whole letter, there's only two names of individuals that actually listened to him favorably. One was a guy named Baruch, which was like his right-hand man. And the other guy was name was Ebed Milek. Take a guess what race that one is. Okay, and that's the two. Ebed Milek was a, a, an Ethiopian that um, took some bed sheets and dropped them down to Jeremiah. Was in a dungeon. He said, "Put the them the things around your armholes," and then he pulled them up out of there. All. Okay, and that's the only two names of people that um, uh, were favorable towards him. So he uh, definitely would not be in the sort of the Lord's uh, newspaper that he had a great ministry. He would not have had a ministry where he probably had, uh, he probably, when he had a Bible study, he probably had uh, 15 or 20 people at the tops. And you would tend to think, wow, that would be discouraging. Okay, being there for four decades... And when he, when he would put out a thing to the, so pe- his friends, say, hey, I'm going to have a Bible study. This is a book I'm going to choose. And if you meet up here this night, we'll have this Bible study. And, you know, 15, 20 people shows up. That would be the, probably the best crowd he has. But yet God honored him. There's a lot of preachers around the world that uh, minister to 15 or 20 people. As long as they stay faithful to that, God will still honor that. So... That's Jeremiah's ministry. Uh, Now, how we know it's negative all the way through there, okay, um, his hometown opposed him. That'd be chapter 11, verse 23, the entire hometown, his hometown opposed him, up against him. Okay, chapter 11, verse 23, and there shall be no remnant of them, for I will bring evil upon the men of Anathoth, even the year of their visitation. That's his hometown, Anathoth. And they were all against them. The number 13 is very significant, very prominent role in Jeremiah. The number 13, you have 52 chapters. That's 52 divided by 4. That's a full deck. 13. Okay, and in 13, you'll find the word outcast and cast out 13 times throughout the book. The word backsliding and backslidings. Found 14 times in the Bible, 13 in Jeremiah. 
Okay, and so it's very instrumental, 13, throughout this. You'll see even it starts off that way, chapter 1, at the end of verse 2, in the 13th year of his reign. And so when you see the numbers like this in a Bible, numbers don't lie, they say, a common saying, numbers don't lie. Uh, this is what uh, makes the Bible very unique. And you'll see things like this, and you'll find that all through the Bible, and it's not a coincidence. It, you know, coincidence is God remaining anonymous. Okay, but uh, Jeremiah had very, very few people listening to him, and this was pointed out to him on several occasions. Okay, several times the... Uh, media of the day or the uh, big shots of the day pointed out several times to him, well, you just take that little remnant you got and go hide in the woods. And one of these guys pulled this out on him. This guy, Jeremiah did some illustration, what was going to happen to them, and this guy opposed him. And Jeremiah said, well, we'll find out. We'll find out in just a few months when you're dead and gone. And the guy died about two months later. Now, if you had that kind of power in your type of a ministry, that would be very effective. But that's Old Testament doctrine. Okay, and so Old Testament doctrine, God would uh, often uh, follow through on the statements that the prophets would say. In the death of a person or in the disease of an individual, okay, with uh, a fellow where a guy opposed him named uh, Jeroboam. And Jeroboam got leprosy, boom, just like that. And then a guy prayed for him. He got healed just like that. Okay, that's Old Testament doctrine. And so in the New Testament, we have a different program. If you would, chapter 15, verse 15, here's the very, very small remnant that he had that, that listened to him. Chapter 15, verse 15. O Lord, thou knowest, remember me and visit me. Revenge me of my persecutors. Okay, that is an Old Testament prayer. That was allowed under the Old Testament. Uh, the New Testament does have different things to say than that. But he says, Revenge me of my persecutors. Take me not away in thy long suffering. Know that for thy sake I have suffered rebuke. Thy words were found and I did eat them. Fanatical about the words of God. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. Okay, Jeremiah, the J-E at the beginning of his name is the name, the brief, the very short way of writing Yah or Jah or Jehovah. Okay, then he says in verse 7, I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone. Because of thy hand, for thou hast filled me with indignation. He's all by himself. All by himself. He didn't have a wife. He was told not to get married. So he was ordered by God not to get married. You see that in chapter 16, verse 1, verse 2. And so he had nobody to go home to, to complain about the work day. He was all by himself. Except he had the Lord on his side. And on verse 18, chapter 15, it says, Why is my pain per perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuseth to be healed? Wilt thou be altogether unto me as a liar and as waters that fail? So he's accusing God of lying to him. And so he'll have his days. You know, I kind of like Jeremiah. You know, he'll have his days where he'll throw in his resignation and say, I quit. And the Lord said, okay, go ahead and quit. And then he'd say, well, can I pick it back up, you know, and try some more, you know. I mean, it was back and forth, back and forth. And you got to understand that. I mean, you throw it in jail, then you're out of jail, then you're by yourself, and then this guy's fighting you, and this guy's arguing with you, this one over here, and you feel like, man, everybody's against me. And in his case, that was absolutely true. But God used him to write 57 chapters in our Bible. And God used him as an example to the Jewish evangelists of the tribulation time period who are told by God not to get married. And the reason why in both cases this is true is because when society, society uh, runs amok and when foreign troops come in, the only ones that technically make it through it are people who are all by themselves and they can run 
at any time they get a chance. I mean, because if you have kids, you've got to be dragging the kids along. That's why it says, woe unto them, woe unto her that gives suck in those days. When a mother tries to run away from the Antichrist troops and she's got three little ones, I mean, they're all going to get caught. And so that's why God has it arranged, prearranged, that it's going to be individual young men who can get up and go anywhere they can as fast as they can. And that's what Jeremiah had to do. I mean, that's what he was typifying, even though he was staying in Jerusalem. Now, in Matthew 20, uh, 16, verse 14, one time the Lord Jesus said to the apostles, Whom do men say that I am? And they said, uh, Some of them say you're like Jeremiah. So when you read some of Jeremiah's sermons, as you read through there, you'll see, especially chapter 23, that he really hit some hard. And uh, here's what he was told to do one time in Jeremiah 7. He said, here's what I want you to do, Jeremiah. Now, if you want to get real popular, well-known in the area, this is all you have to do. Okay? He told Jeremiah, go down to the Jewish temple. They only had one temple. That's their place of worship. He says, stand out front with a sign and say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, and tell them that when they're walking in, you're going to listen to a bunch of liars. Okay, so if you want to get real popular, go over here to St. E's, Saturday night, Sunday morning, or down to Rensselaer in front of St. A's, Saturday night, Sunday morning, hold up a sign, says Father Flanagan's a sodomite, and uh, possibility... You are going to get well known. And then get you a little Mary statue and tie a rope around her neck and then hang it up on your front lawn. You will get, I would advise to have a house insurance because it's probably going to get burned down. Okay? In essence, that's what Jeremiah was told to do. That's radical. That is very radical. Okay, but that's what God told him to do, and he did it. He did it. And so that was Jeremiah chapter 7. You're going to read down through that one. In chapter 39, here's the name of the fellow that pulled him up out of a dungeon. Ebed Milek. Chapter 39, verse 15. Jeremiah 39, 15. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying. Okay, so this is after, maybe a few months after, this uh, fella, ebed Melech pulled him up out of the prison. Okay, so he was some type of a guard or jailer. And he, he, he said to the, you know, the king, he said, he's going to, he's alike to die. He's going to die down there. Why don't you let me pull him up out of here? So he pulled him up out of there. And here is the blessing God gave Ebed for helping out Jeremiah. Verse 16, go speak to Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring my words upon this city for evil. Okay, so this city's coming down. And not for good. And they shall be accomplished in the day before thee. But I will deliver thee in that day. Don't you know that guy was excited about that? Wow, really? I'm going to deliver thee, saith the Lord, and thou shalt not be given into the hand of the men whom thou art afraid. He was deathly afraid the Babylonians were going to come in and kill him. For I will surely deliver thee, and thou shalt not fall by the sword, but thy life shall be for a prey unto thee, because thou hast put thy trust in me, saith the Lord. And so that would have been great news to Ebed Melech, especially when the news reports came in that the Babylonian army was coming in, and when the Babylonian army set up their troops outside of the city. And then all the city was shut up, and for 18 months, nobody can go in, nobody could go out. 
And that's when the Lord sent this message to Ebed, Melech, about, okay, the city's coming down. There's nothing that's going to change that. It's coming down. It's bad. But you will be spared. And then at that time, he says, boy, I am sure glad I helped Jeremiah. <laughs> I got on his side. And that was a great blessing God gave him. Okay, now the basic doctrinal truth of Jeremiah. If you look at the Bible uh, doctrinally, now most, most uh, Bible teachers or preachers view the Bible instructionally, devotionally, spiritually. And you can do that from cover to cover, very easy to do. You can preach it from cover to cover, spiritually, uh, motivationally, inspir inspirationally, spiritually. But when you look at the Bible doctrinally, then what you're doing is you're looking at the Bible from God's perspective down rather than our perspective up. Jeremiah's basic doctrinal truth is the prophecy of the tribulation time period. And I've already mentioned it. He was ordered to remain single. It's chapter 16, verse 2. And the reason why is he typifies chapter 14 of Revelation... The 144,000 Jewish men that uh, will become uh, evangelists that run throughout the whole world and preach the gospel of the kingdom. That's what they're going to preach. And they will not have to go to language school because they will automatically have the gift of tongues. All that comes back in place. They will have the gift of healing, okay, and that will come back in place because God picks up Israel again, and so all the signs come back. And that's these men. It's not Jehovah Witnesses. Chapter 14, verse 1, you see the, the number there, 144,000. And verse 4, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins, so they're virgin men. And that's what Jeremiah typifies. Okay, now, the destruction of Jerusalem is written um, in detail by in lamentation. So you, if you're in Jeremiah, there's right after Jeremiah is a very small book sandwiched between Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And the title is lament, Lamentations or the very short version to lament. It is five very depressing chapters of lamentations because Jeremiah is describing what he saw, what he witnessed. During the 18 months when Babylon was around the city, Jeremiah was inside the city. He was uh, most likely hiding the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, the candlestick. He probably hid all that down underneath in the cave system, uh, probably right below uh, uh, in the area where the blood of Christ could land out there in Calvary. Okay, but um, at that time, and so then uh, when Babylon come in, there's no record of them finding the Ark of the Covenant, table of showbread, all that stuff, because Jeremiah hid it during that time. And then he watched people starve to death, okay, on the streets. 18 months. No food coming in, no food going out. I mean, they had absolutely nothing. I mean, the average American right now uh, have, Americans have become conditioned. Where if the semis, the trucks stop running, the average American thinks they're going to starve to death in three days. Okay, even though a lot of them got enough that they could live off about, you know, 80 days. Okay, but... As far as their household goods, I mean, just look in your house and look in your cupboards. How long could you survive in your house if no food ever came in? How long could you survive? Okay, and um, Americans have come, become conditioned to that. It used to be that Americans lived annually. Okay, they lived annually because of the life of a farmer. Or say they plan annually and they plan for the crop to come in or the cattle to be slaughtered or stuff like that. But Americans now, they have a very small freezer, one refrigerator, 
Okay, and if the trucks stop running, the, the uh, grocery stores will be bare in less than 12 hours. You ever see when hurricanes coming into Florida and the, the, the grocery stores and how they just wipe it out? Okay, and America is living on a three-day supply. That's about American, and we've become a condition to that. And that's very dangerous. So a person should have some food supplies on hand, and then you rotate them around, okay? But um, in Jeremiah's day, they had 18 months. So they had, you know, the super food supply probably ran out about 15 months, and then they're starting to survive on what's left over. So let's go to Lamentations a little bit and describe, read what Jeremiah saw, what he witnessed. Okay, doctrinally, Lamentations chapter 4, verse 21 shows that this is a tribulation passage. Lamentations 4, verse 21. Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, that dwellest in the land of Uz. Okay, if that little name rings a bell, Uz, not Oz. That was a pagan show years ago that uh, mocked Christianity, where you follow a yellow brick road, you get to the end, you get a nothing but a bunch of hot air. So it was a mockery of God, and it was a very subtle thing describing political situation in America. It's a very subtle thing also, dealing with a straw man. Okay, but us is where Job was. Job uh, was in the land of Uz, and Job has 42 chapters that matches the 42 months of the tribulation, the great tribulation. Okay, now, he's telling them to rejoice, but yet Jeremiah is in Jerusalem. He says, The cup also shall pass through unto thee, thou shalt be drunken, thou shalt make thyself naked. The punishment of thine iniquity is accomplished, O daughter of Zion. So the Jews ran down to Uz. And that's uh, Petra. He will no more carry, uh, no more carry thee away into captivity. He will visit thine iniquity, O daughter of Edom. He will discover thy sins. Okay, what did Jeremiah witness? Chapter two, verse twenty. And if you read Lamentations, you read through there, and he's describing historically what happened to Jerusalem. Doctrinally, the destruction of uh, Jerusalem is recorded three times in the Bible, and that shows that three times in history Jerusalem is going to be destroyed or the temple is going to be destroyed. In chapter 2, verse 20, Behold, O Lord, and consider to whom thou hast done this. Shall the women eat their fruit and children of a span long? Shall the priest and the prophet be slain in the sanctuary of the Lord? So a span is about nine inches. It's about your hand. Okay? And NBA starts about 12 or 14 inches. Okay? But the average span is about nine inches. So when a baby is born at nine inches, it's a preemie. Probably died dead. Okay? And so... Here she's got this dead baby. She's starving to death, so what's she going to do? Well, the verse, and there's other places in the Bible where this is recorded. She eats it. Okay, they're starving to death. That's how bad it got. Okay, this was recorded also in uh, Leviticus. God told them in Leviticus, if you, if you don't listen to me, If you turn your back on me, this is what's going to happen. He told them in Leviticus 26. He told them in Deuteronomy 28. Both places he told them that. And then it happened in 2 Kings 6. And it happened here again. And in the tribulation time period, it's going to happen again. Okay, and that's how bad it gets. So that's the doctrinal Uh, truth of Lamentations and Jeremiah. It's about the tribulation time period. Bad, bad. It's going to get so bad. People can't imagine how bad it's going to get. Okay, some practical things. Some practical instructions is about the spiritual life of a believer where backsliding, 
found 13 times. Backsliding, only other time it's found in the Bible is Proverbs 14, 14, and it says the backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Okay, practically speaking, backsliding is a decrease of our fellowship with the Lord. Okay, Hosea happened to write the word backsliding three times. So it's 17 times told in the Bible, one in Proverbs, 13 Jeremiah, three in Hosea. And a backslider is not somebody who turns their back on God, is they're walking backwards away from God. They're backsliding. Okay, and so they may be facing God, but yet they're backwards sliding from God. Interesting, I think it's very interesting. The word pastor and its plural pastors is found nine times in the Bible, eight in Jeremiah. You only find it once in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and Jeremiah is a picture of a faithful pastor. And then you can run through Jeremiah and look up every verse that has the word pastor. And we'll just try one of them, Jeremiah 23, verse 1 and 2. I actually two of them here. Jeremiah was pretty well... Uh, Death on the pastors of his day. He railed on them. Jeremiah 23 and Matthew 23 are two of the meanest chapters in the Bible. One is Jesus going after the scribes and Pharisees of his day. And the other is Jeremiah going after the pastors, priests, and prophets of his day. 23 verse 1. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastors, saith the Lord. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, that have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them, behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And when you read through that whole thing, wow, he, he goes after him, and then he shows what their problem is, is in verse 36. Problem is... The burden of the Lord shall you mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts our God. So they changed the words of the Masoretic text, the Old Testament. Perverted the Bible. And perverted the Bible, as far as the Bible goes, and in their lives were probably perverted also. Because they go one and the same. Now, here's one chapter of Jeremiah that you won't read in any Bible college in America. No seminary will discuss Jeremiah 36. They're not going to discuss it. They're not going to read it. Uh, I went through Hiles Anderson, didn't even hear about Jeremiah 36. Was a Grace College, never even heard or mentioned Jeremiah 36. Moody Bible Institute won't talk about it. Dallas Theological Seminary, Philadelphia College of the Bible will not read this chapter. And it's the reason why it is how God is going to preserve his words. Okay, and it, and it demonstrates double inspiration, triple inspiration, quadruple inspiration. These guys don't believe in double inspiration. The Bible teaches it. Jeremiah 36 is Jeremiah. Uh, one of my favorite questions in the Bible is in Jeremiah 36, uh, verse 17. I love this question. I love the answer probably more than the question. But Jeremiah is in jail, and God gave him a message. He gave it to Baruch. Baruch he said to Baruch, go read this to Jehudi, and go read it to the king for me. He does that. These guys go ballistic. Okay, and in verse 17, they asked Baruch, saying, Tell us now, how didst thou write all these words at his mouth? Love the answer. Love it. He pronounced all these words unto me with his mouth, and I wrote them with ink in a book. Love it. That's how they should answer some of these media questions. You know, just, I mean, you can, you just look and say, did your light bulb blow out? You know, I mean, what's so hard about that? (laughs) 
Well, what happened is uh, he had this scroll, so that's original number one, and a guy cut it up. He didn't like certain parts of it, like origin didn't, and then he threw it in the fire. So original number one got burned in the fire, and then God said to Jeremiah, I want you to write the same things and add to it other words. So that's original number two, double inspiration. And then after he got done with original number two, chapter 51, verse 63 says, Now I want you to take this over to the Euphrates River, which was, man, how long of a walk would have that been? Euphrates River. He was in Jerusalem. Take it to Euphrates River. Let's see, 300, 200 miles, 200, 600, about six, five to 600 miles. I sure hope he had the Spirit of God take him by transportation. He said, take that second original over to Euphrates River and hide it under a rock. And then he went back to Jerusalem, and then he said, oh, go back over there and get that uh, manuscript over there. And he went back over there, it was all marred. Okay, and it was all destroyed. So that's original number two gone. So how did we get original number three? God's words are preserved in spite of man. Jeremiah 36. That's, that's the process, Jeremiah 36. Beautiful, it's just beautiful. Okay, and then uh, let's see, one more place, Lamentations, and let's see why, why, the basic reason why uh, Israel was uh, destroyed by God, and Jeremiah told them in his letter why is because they rejected the words of God. Okay, in... in uh, Lamentations, he writes, the reason why is you rejected what God said. Now, I think I got 218 written here. Okay, where he says, their heart cried unto the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears run down like a river day and night. Give thyself no rest. Let not the apple of thine eyes cease. Arise, cry. So he's talking about all their cryings. Okay, why did all that happen? It's because they rejected God's words. And Jeremiah said that in 23, 22. You see, the, the end result of a nation is not what happens in politics. Okay, it's, you know, it's, it's nice that Queen Hillary didn't get an office. Okay, but our hope is not in Donald Trump. Okay, the seminaries are still rejecting the words of God. The prophets and the pastors of America are still rejecting the word of God. And even the ones that, there were more prayers at this inaugural than any inaugural ever, ever, but I didn't hear one person read from a pure Bible. Franklin Graham did not do it. Uh, the Blondie didn't do it. Whatever her name was, the uh, frost, the bleach blonde woman that was... Um, pastor, first time they had a female pastor. She didn't read from a pure Bible. None of them did because none of them believe there's a pure Bible. And so the only hope our nation has is to get back to the book. That's where the real hope is. Okay, now we, we are thankful for, uh, you know, what, you know, the, the ones in office and rather than the other one, we're thankful for that. Praise the Lord for that. But if our nation really is going to uh, survive, it needs to get back to the old book. Okay, let's pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to uh, rejoice in your words, help us to uh, be faithful to your words, and thank you for the testimony of Jeremiah. There's so much more could have been said about him and about his book uh, or books, Lamentation. I just pray that you'd uh, help us to be faithful to your words. Like Jeremiah said, I did find thy words and eat them. He was a fanatic about the words of God. Help us to be that way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.